Hello, my name is Battalion Chief Ronald Lewis with the Fayetteville Fire Emergency Management Department, and welcome to Brave the Fire. Here at the Fire Department, we're committed to the preservation of life, property, and the environment in our community through effective public education, fire code enforcement, and emergency response. As Fire Marshal for the City of Fayetteville, inspecting retail businesses, establishments, and places of assembly for fire code violations that put the public at risk is one of my primary objectives. However, educating the general public to the dangers of fire and smoke in the home is the greatest part of that mission. Approximately 90% of the fires we responded to last year were in single-family dwellings, homes just like yours and mine. And of those, most started in the kitchen from unattended cooking. Understanding, implementing, and staying ever vigilant to the strategies for preventing accidental fires in your home is your best defense against accidental injury or death from smoke and flames. Simple measures are often the most overlooked. Having a working smoke detector is the second line of defense so that all members of the home have an early warning to the presence of smoke. This will allow the residents to be evacuated immediately and safely to the outside. Today, we will meet some of the firefighters on the front line of our education efforts here at the Fayetteville Fire Department and see just how their commitment to public fire education is helping to save lives in our community. I hope you will find this information informative and useful so that you too can help us brave the fire. The smoke alarm program for the CFA was a program that we had sponsored uh, to where we can go to the residents uh, in the community and perform impromptu safety inspections. Uh, what we'll do is we'll offer to test the detectors in the residence. If they don't work, we'll replace them with a 10-year lithium battery uh, alarm. Uh, there's literally no maintenance to perform. All we ask that they test them once a month. Um, it's a program that's one of the more popular programs that the fire department offers, uh, and it's also one that we're pretty proud of. Well, what we do is first we identify the neighborhood we're going to be in by using data and statistics. At-risk neighborhoods that may have a higher propensity for alarms that don't work or, or non-functioning alarms or may not have enough uh, resources to provide their own. So we target those neighborhoods to begin with. Once that's identified, we'll of course get the crews that service that area because they're going to be more familiar with it. Um, we brief the, the, uh, the firefighters that uh, this, is a, this program is to be a completely positive experience uh, for the homeowner. We'll, come, we'll approach the homeowner, introduce who we are, and offer them our services. Uh, once, we, once we're in the home, We'll do it, like I said, we'll offer them impromptu inspection, uh, make sure that the homeowner doesn't have any hazards that they weren't aware of in the home, and we'll also test their detectors in the home. Whatever we find is not working, we'll go ahead and replace at that, at that point. There's zero cost to the program. We really tailor every visit to the customer. Um, not all two visits are the same. So the length of stay is gonna range anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. Like I said, it's a program that we believe in. Um, it's a program that we, we have been offering uh, for some time now, and it's actually shown some success. As we know, working smoke alarms have been proven to save lives, uh, so it only makes sense for us to support a program such as this. Uh, when we arrive at a residence, of course, we know people do have work. Uh, if they aren't home, what we will do is leave a door hanger on their property, uh, somewhere conspicuous where they can find it when they get home, to let them know that we've been there. Uh, it's written in English on one side and Spanish on the other one. And what it does is it gives them a point of contact for the fire department where they can call us back so they don't miss this opportunity. When they call, we schedule the local, the local um, company that services that community. They will come out and do the exact same service that we're providing today. They'll offer the home inspection, they'll offer the smoke, smoke alarm testing and installation. And there still is no charge for that either. The importance of a, a working smoke alarm in your home is it gives you advanced warning so you can actually find egress, to find a way out of your house. Um, as most are well aware, it, well, the fire may be the most fantastic part of the event to look at, but we know that smoke is the killer. Uh, so what a smoke alarm, the purpose of a smoke alarm is to give them a, a, an opportunity to get out of the house safely before smoke you know, overcomes their abilities to. When we, get, when we try to determine where the smoke alarms are going to go in the house, we actually have to tour the house. Uh, we need to have a pretty deep, under, good understanding of the footprint of the home so we can provide a, as much protection as possible. Now, we're not afraid to install multiple de detectors. In fact, we just put three in this gentleman's home. Um, the primary consideration is that we avoid kitchens and we avoid um, garages and we avoid any areas where air handlers may be or um, products that 
kick up dust. We don't, we don't really want the false alarms occurring. Uh, so what we do focus on is the living areas of the home and the bedroom specifically. So we will protect all of those areas of the home. If a resident has an interest in the program, they do want to participate, if they'll call 433-1730, uh, they call that and they'll go ahead and schedule an appointment to come visit them. A, a lot of the, my responsibility is for uh, directing a lot of the public education programs for the city. I will tell you hands down, this is probably my favorite program uh, that I do get to offer. Uh, simply because if one, number one, it gets me away from the office, number two, it's proven effective, um, and who doesn't like effectiveness? And, and number three, it gets you into the community and you get to interface with the residents. And quite frankly, that's why most people become firemen, because we like to help people. Uh, so this is an administrative way for me to get out into the public, interface with them, um, and, and do some good. The program is, is a complete, completely positive program, and it's proven effective. Uh, so this is something that I strongly support. The fire department, fire, fire department is placing uh, fire detectors in my home, and I appreciate that. Uh, I just received a notice from the fire, fire department uh, yesterday, and I've seen them on the street and asked them to come over here and come in for me. <laughs> uh, they put them in the living room near the bedroom, my uh, intermediate bedroom where my grandchildren stay, and in front of my bedroom uh, in the back of the house. Been outstanding, done a great job, and very polite and courteous. I'm really impressed. And you know, I feel more secure now. Uh, it's like I say, I was a little slack on getting them in myself, and I appreciate what they're doing for me. It's a really great program. Did you know that 65% of all home fire deaths happen in homes that either have no smoke alarms or the smoke alarms that are present are not working? You need working smoke alarms in your home to give you an early warning to get out in a fire. Here is some important information for you on smoke alarms from the National Fire Protection Association. When buying a smoke alarm, make sure it has the label of an independent testing laboratory. For the best protection, you should have both photoelectric and ionization type smoke alarms. A photoelectric alarm is more responsive to smoldering fires, like a fire started by a discarded cigarette. An ionization alarm is more responsive to flaming fires, such as a grease fire on the stove. There are smoke alarms available that are both photoelectric and ionization. Look for features that are important to you, such as a hush button to temporarily silence a nuisance alarm or an alarm that can be tested using the television remote control. You need a smoke alarm in every bedroom, outside each sleeping area, and on every level of your home, including the basement. Interconnect the smoke alarms so that when one sounds, they all sound. Smoke alarms can be interconnected through your electrical system by a qualified electrician. Or wireless interconnected smoke alarms are now available that you can install yourself. Test all your smoke alarms at least once a month by pushing the test button like this. Replace batteries in all your smoke alarms, both hardwired and battery operated, once a year or when the alarm chirps, indicating a low battery. If your smoke alarm is more than 10 years old, it's time to replace it. Working smoke alarms in the home will give you the early warning you need to get out in a fire. Test your smoke alarms today to make sure they are working. Uh, we're at a scene of a residential structure fire that uh, was caused by unattended cooking on a stove. I mean, the occupant was frying french fries, put some fries into the oil, left the room for an unknown amount of time, um, left the cooking unattended, came back to the room, in which time there was fire on top of the grease in which he was cooking in on top of the stove. The occupant did try to put it out. Uh, he did not have a fire extinguisher. Um, and the fire got out of hand and, and got beyond, into the cabinets and beyond what he could uh, deal with and then he exited the residence and called the fire department. Kitchen fires are the result of about 90 percent of our house fires in the city of Fayetteville um, and they're attributed to unattended cooking. Uh, people put food on the stove, leave it in a pot, especially greasy foods, 
um, leave the room, not realize how long they're gone, go to fold laundry, whatever they do, and they come back and then they have a fire on top of the stove. Um, attributing factors that is next is the inability to put a fire out, not having a readily um, dry chemical fire extinguisher, trying to put water on the fire, or, or just not doing anything at all, and that would attribute to most of the damage. If you come in and you notice fire and it's contained to a pot, and you don't have a fire extinguisher, the next best thing would just take a lid and place it over the top of the pot. Um, the lack of oxygen would put out the fire. Um, if it's safe to do so, you could take the handle of the pot and move it off to a burner that's not active. If the fire gets beyond the pot itself, starts to get on the stove top, and you don't have a fire extinguisher, then it's recommended that you just exit the structure, call 911, let the fire department handle it at that point. Some of the other leading causes of kitchen fires are improperly discarded smoking material, uh, not necessarily dropping a cigarette in the cushion, but taking an ashtray and dumping an ashtray that's still got hot embers into a trash can that has you know, paper towels, greasy napkins, and things like that. And then also uh, unattended or, or candles. Uh, a lot of people like to set up candles. They smell good, and they leave them burning, they forget. And uh, that's another thing that attributes to them as far as accidental causes. The majority of our electrical fires are caused by extension cords, improper use of extension cords, um, overloading extension cord. Uh, without getting real in-depth in, electri in electricity and giving a class, it, normal residential homes are set up for 20 amperage on any individual plug, wall plug that's in your house. And if you take an extension cord that's only able to handle 15 amperes, the extension cord is going to burn out, but it's not going to trip your circuit breaker because the household's made for 20. So you, you can overload the cord without overloading the house, and that's where you'll get the breakdown in the fire. And I've been investigating and going to fires for 15 years, and, and I would say probably 90 to 95 percent of the fires that we go to could be avoided uh, if, if the individuals living there took a little bit of precaution of what we've talked about earlier today. Um, the other 5 percent, there are once in a while where you'll have mechanical failures of a house itself, internal uh, electri electricity that you, you can't see, that's very rare, and then the other cause would be a lightning. And in the summertime, we have a lot of lightning, and that's just not controllable. But once again, it's a very rare in the big scheme of things. When I come to the scene and investigate fires, uh, first thing I'll do is do an overall look at the house. I'll talk to the firemen that first arrived on the scene, what kind of things they seen, what they did. If an occupant's available, I'll talk to the occupant and ask what kind of things they were doing inside the house, what activities were going on, when they noticed the fire, where they noticed it. Um, from that point, once I gather all that data, I'll start inside the structure. I'll go from the least areas burnt and follow char patterns and different signatures of fire movement to trace back to where I can get to what we call an area of origin. Once I get to an area of origin of fire, basically the area where the fire started, then I'll start looking for what we call competent ignition sources. Um, what ignition source in this area could have started this fire? Uh, sometimes they're very easy. A pot on the stove is a very competent ignition source. Sometimes they're a little bit more complex, uh, like a cigarette butt discarded in a trash can. You, you can see some of the smoke damage and some of the burn patterns. Um, a lot of it's been damaged from um, the firefighter overhaul. After we do a fire investigation and we've completed our investigation, the firemen will go back in and then make sure that there's no hidden fires. So they'll pull down cabinets, uh, move stoves, and do anything else to ensure we don't have a rekindle of the fire. We, we take photos of all our fire scenes, either as a department ourselves, or we work with the Fayetteville Police Department Forensics. Um, if we need to do evidence collection, uh, we'll work with Fayetteville Police Department Forensics, and we document every scene, both paper and uh, photograph. And one thing we can recommend to all residents is they should have working smoke alarms, at least one in a main hallway and one outside of each bedroom. Um, if you have two stories, you want one in the top floor and, and, and the bottom floor. And make sure that they're properly operating. We change our batteries every spring and fall when we change our clocks. And, and that'll help keep people safe when they do have these accidental fires and get them out of the house. And at this time, I'm going to take you inside the house and show you some of the cause and effects of a kitchen fire. They've overhauled a lot of it, it's hard to see, but you still got the pot on the stove where, where he was cooking the grease, and, and you can see where the char patterns go up into the, right into the attic. 
um, uses the, the vent over the stove is usually the, the quickest way for a fire to get in the attic. And uh, everything else around here is just, just heat and char damage from just the fire building inside the room. Um, burnt most of the cabinets away. Um, then we talk about going from least to most. You, if you trace back as the fire built up in this room and started working out, heat always stays high so you can see where it starts peeling the paint. And, and the fire comes across here and burns, burn the top of the door. But fire is always trying to go up and out, trying to reach cooler atmosphere to help it gain intensity. And that's why as you move farther away from the fire, you're going to get a lot more high damage of heat and fire and not so much on the low side. And that's how we end up working the scene and working it all the way back to where I said the area of origin. We can tell in here it was just a lot of smoke. What we have across in an even pattern is what we call line of demarcation. That means the smoke built up high in this room, and as more smoke came, it just slowly kept banking down. And that's where you have that nice even line. Because smoke's going to, with the atmosphere, it's going to level itself off until it finds an exit port. And that's where you'll get the lines of demarcation. That would tell us that a lot of smoke was in here banking down, but not a lot of fire. I wonder if they got any smoke detectors in here, you'd be able to see them. No, they didn't. They didn't have any smoke detectors in this house. So it was fortunate that an individual was awake and was able to come back in and see the fire. Sometimes these kitchen fires, we get people cooking at night, um, come home from work, come home from the bar, or whatever they're doing at night. They put some food on. They go sit on the couch, they doze off. Next thing you know, they wake up and there's a fire. Um, in a particular residence like this with no smoke detectors, that becomes, could become a deadly event where, where the individual succumbs to uh, the fire and smoke injuries before he's alerted. And unfortunately, we've dealt with that before. And if you step in the bathroom here too, once again, you'll see the lines of demarcation where the smoke built up from from top down here. The extreme amount of heat that was in here, it started melting the tops of uh, deodorant and shaving cream and soap bottles. They'll show you how much heat was already building up in just in this room. The walker and the pampers lets us know that there was children living in this house or at least one young child. Um, in this room again, you can see the amount of how extreme the heat damage gets. The, the line of demarcation of smoke's a little bit higher because this is the farthest room from the, from the kitchen where the fire started. But once again, you can see how the heat traveled and it melted the blinds from the top down. So that's how much heat this far away from the room was building up. And like I said, we've, just like I said when I investigate, we've gone from all the areas of least damage and we'd work our back way into the, the room of origin, which would have been the kitchen. And when we get in the kitchen and start looking for the cause of the fire, I'll start looking at the high areas around the room and then try to go down to the lowest point of burn to, to get to where, where the uh, point of origin is. And as a, this room, it's hard to do now because it's been overhauled and tore up. But as we start following the, the trail of fire and burnt and smoke, we come back to the stove. And this particular fire was started by food on the stove. Uh, the gentleman was frying French fries. Like I said, he left the room for some time. When he came back, there was a small fire on the stove. He said he tried to extinguish it, and then it became larger, in which time he left the building and called 911. And then this fire grew from the stove up into the cabinets. It got into the, the, uh, the vent that's over your stove to pull the smoke and steam out, and it used that as a portal to get into the attic. So it didn't take very long for this fire to not only consume this room, but then find its way in the attic, where it could have been catastrophic. From, from a pot on the stove, the fire would have took from a pot on the stove to get into the attic, it could take anywhere from two to, two to four or five minutes. Um, some of the factors that will come in is, was there a window or a door open? Is there free-flowing air? Um, but 
typically rough average five minutes a fire can go from a pot on the stove to being in the attic. Some of our investigation classes, we did some testing with, AT, with the ATF and uh, SBI and, and a room this size could go from a single point of ignition to what we call flashover. The entire room consumed in fire in about five, six minutes. The one thing, I've been doing this for 15 years and the hardest part about doing a job is when you come into any of these houses is that you see people displaced. Um, hopefully there were no injuries or, or fatalities, but just this fear, uh, the sheerness that families are displaced, children are displaced, they lose, uh, lose their clothing, they lose all their personal effects, and, and that's the hardest thing, and that's why we do programs, do fire prevention programs to help keep people as safe as they can be so they don't have to suffer the agonies of, of the losses. You are about to see a fire, one that has been planned, a demonstration fire. An ashtray with a still smoldering cigarette is dumped into the wastebasket. Two minutes, eight seconds. The contents of the wastebasket are smoldering. Seven minutes, three seconds. The wastebasket is in flames. Nine minutes, 14 seconds. The room is an inferno. You are about to experience the power of fire. In 1986, I narrated that program called Firepower for the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA. The purpose was to demonstrate the awesome deadly power of a fire and the incredible speed with which a home fire can spread. We wanted viewers to see how quickly a home fire can reach the point of flashover when everything in a room combusts and no one can survive. We wanted viewers to understand that if a fire starts in their home, time is very short and their first priority must be to escape. Our fire begins here in the living room where most home fires start. Let's take a look around. This is in the 1986 video, I took viewers on a tour of a two-story frame house before we set it on fire. The front hallway, sort of a catch-all for a busy family, and the only direct exit for someone who may be upstairs. Let's see what we have on the second floor. We pointed out the sentimental items and the children's clothes and toys, which would soon be destroyed in the fire. In that video, we also pointed out the smoke alarm, which gave a warning that a fire had started. That home was not protected with fire sprinklers, and so the uncontrolled fire destroyed much of the home before the fire department could arrive to fight and extinguish it. But we also did a second demonstration, showing how in a home that was equipped with fire sprinklers, an identical fire was extinguished quickly, before conditions became life-threatening, and before any significant damage was done. Much has changed since we made that video in 1986, yet one thing has remained the same, the awesome destructive power of fire and the speed at which an unchecked home fire reaches the point of no return, flashover. Let's take a look back at the demonstration fire we set in 1986. 30 seconds from first flame, the sofa ignites. From this point, fire grows rapidly. If you discover a fire, leave immediately and call the fire department from a neighbor's house. Nowadays, you might call from your cell phone rather than the neighbor's house, but the point remains the same. When you discover a fire, get out fast and then call the fire department. Let's return to the 1986 fire. One minute, four seconds from first flame, smoke begins to fill the room. One minute, 35 seconds. The smoke layer in the living room descends rapidly. Gases flowing out of this room now exceed 190 degrees Fahrenheit. One minute, 50 seconds. The smoke detector at the foot of the stairs sounds an alarm, providing warning before exits are blocked. Take action immediately. Crawl low where the air is cleaner. Two minutes, 30 seconds. The temperature above the couch is now 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Two minutes, 48 seconds. Smoke pours into the dining room. Thick black smoke moves rapidly upstairs. Three minutes, three seconds. Melted polyurethane burns under the couch. Suddenly, the lampshade ignites. 
The temperature three feet above the floor in this room is over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. No one could survive. From the outside, there may be no evidence of the inferno inside. Three minutes, 41 seconds. The energy in the room suddenly ignites everything. Within one minute, the temperature has risen to over 1,400 degrees. Flashover. Only two minutes after the smoke alarm sounded, we watched as the downstairs and upstairs hallways became impassable. For anyone still inside the house, an emergency escape route would be the only way out. It's important to note that today's larger homes with open designs allow a fire to spread throughout the house quickly. The expanded use of synthetic material along with other modern contents and furnishings provide a powerful fuel source. Back to 1986, as the fire raged inside and out, the fire department arrived. Firefighters wearing protective clothing enter to search the house and to combat the fire. Fire grows so fast that the fire department may not be able to rescue anyone trapped inside. They open walls to check for fire spread. The aftermath of the fire was grim. It took just four minutes from the first flame in the wastebasket for the temperature in this room to reach over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire ultimately became so hot the window glass softened and flowed like taffy. The message today is the same as it was in 1986. You cannot survive flashover. If fire starts in your home, get out immediately and stay out. No matter what precautions you take, no matter how small a fire may appear, its progress is rapid, its power awesome. Escape must be your top priority. In the 1986 video, we showed how quickly home fire sprinklers control and often extinguish a home fire. Today, there are many resources available about home fire sprinklers and their life-saving benefits. For more information, go to the NFPA's Fire Sprinkler Initiative. For educational resources, visit the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition. Excuse me, Dan, but you should be alert when you are cooking and keep anything that can catch fire away from the stovetop. Good job, Dan. It's second and ten at the 42nd yard line. Kettleman takes the snap, he passes it to Kuzinski, and it looks like Kuzinski is going to go all the way. He's at the 40, the 30, the 20, the 10, oh, and he's tackled at the five-yard line. We have time for a quick commercial break, and we're back. Yeah. Always stay in the kitchen when you're frying, grilling, or broiling food. And coming around the final turn, it's That's great, Dan. Now stay safe. Life isn't a cartoon. Cooking is the leading cause of home fires. Don't be a doofus. Learn more about preventing home fires at nfpa.org.